Uh, this is always something I've been interested for, something that I've, I've, I've wanted to enrich myself with. I think a lot of people, you're, you're a busy guy, as far as I can tell. You do speaking engagement lectures. You operate a YouTube channel, presumably. You're a voracious reader. I saw you on the couch. You had a book open. You had like a moment. You're reading. Yeah. And you're a prolific tweeter. You tweet a lot. <laughs> so my question is, how do you... manic or- tweeter. <laughs> you, are a, you are a prolific <laughs> tweeter. How do you organize your time? How do you remain focused and productive in the face of insurmountable work? Lists, mm. schedules, and I have help. I mean, my wife in particular in the last year has been unbelievably helpful. I mean, it's become a full-time job for her really, mm. helping mm. me manage my schedule and mm. keep me on track. But a lot of it is like I get up in the morning, I have like everything scheduled. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. There's a hierarchy of of <coughs> uh, of priority. Mm. And, and I'm really operating on a day-to-day level right now because right. there's so many mm. things to do. I can't look more than about a day or two ahead, although it's, it's, it's basically scheduled. Mm. You know, but um, I learned to discipline myself when I was in graduate school, when I was writing. I, I wrote a book called Maps of Meaning that was published in 1999, and I worked for that on that for about 15 years, about three hours a day. And I really sort of grabbed myself by the scruff of the neck and like forced myself to learn how to concentrate without without deviation. How do you do that? You know? I mean, what do you, how, how do you, how do you focus that intensely? Cause I, I often have trouble like, yeah, I get overwhelmed sometimes when, when I have a lot of work and the, the worst feeling is like when I feel like I have a ton of work and I do work all day, but I still feel like I didn't get anything done. Yeah. Yeah. But you and probably did. You probably did. Probably. Are you a conscientious person? Do you know? I don't even know what, what you, exactly that means. Yeah, oh, how do you okay. Define that? Well, okay. So that's another thing we could mention briefly. I have a uh, website called understandmyself.com, and I set up a coupon code for your viewers. Oh, okay. yeah. What is so it? So it's H3H3. Oh. Uh, what, cool. Say that so you are the domain. Understandmyself.com. Okay. And you can go there and take a personality test that was devised in my lab. Uh, the main researcher was Dr. Colin DeYoung, who is now a professor at the University of Minnesota. But we took the standard big five trait model, which is the standard modern personality model. So that's extroversion, which is a positive emotion dimension. And extroverted people are enthusiastic and assertive. So you're both enthusiastic. You're really assertive. That would be my guess. I can be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't be doing this sort of thing if, yeah, if okay. you weren't extroverted. Okay, right? sure. Yeah. So because, you know, you're, 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 you're verbally fluent and, and um, you like to engage in that sort of thing. Um, so that's a positive emotion to mention. It's associated with the positive emotion that you feel when you're moving towards desired things. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next dimension is sometimes it's called neuroticism and sometimes it's called Lots negative emotionality. <laughs> well, Big on neuroticism. people who are high in neuroticism uh, have some anticipatory anxiety. Um, you know, you know, you have anticipatory anxiety if you're worried about going somewhere yep. and it really bugs you. And then you get there and like 20 minutes later, you're calm and it's okay. Big time. So, Every yeah. single time. Big time. <laughs> okay. Every week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's withdrawal. That's, that's an aspect of, of neuroticism known as withdrawal. And the other that. aspect is volatility and volatile people are touchy and irritable. Huh. So, and, and that's, that's the second dimension. The third dimension is agreeableness and agreeable people are compassionate and polite Mm. Mm. and disagreeable people are competitive and blunt. Mm. And so women are higher in agreeableness than men. Um, So if you take a random man and a random woman out of the population, general population, and you bet on who is more agreeable, if you bet on the woman, you'd be right (laughs) 60% of the Mm. time. And the other place where men and women differ is with trait neuroticism. Women are more susceptible to anxiety and depression. So, if but you, how can you say that if genders don't exist? Well, yeah, that, that's okay. another thing yeah. that I'm general, genuinely <laughs> accused of is that biological essentialism. Yeah, and then, uh, but uh, what I feel like I experiencing those different feelings depending on the day. Yeah, sometimes I'm more extroverted. Some days I'm more reclusive. You know, uh, is it generally... That's probably volatility too. It's mm. like variation okay. mm. in mood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever had periods of depression? Yeah. How long? I mean, you don't have to tell me. No, obviously. I can tell you. It's okay. In college, I'd say a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a long time. Well, yeah. so that would be an indication. Well, it could be an indication of many things, mm. but that's often associated with higher levels of trait neuroticism. Because you see, it isn't obvious how much negative emotion you should feel. Like, let's say you wake up in the morning and you have an ache in your side. It's like, well, is that nothing or cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't know. Like, you shouldn't jump to the whole cancer conclusion. 
Right. But, but Ethan I would. would. Immediately. Well, but you can't tell, eh? Like, it's yeah. not necessary. Like, and you think, well, if it is cancer and you miss it, well, that's not so good. Yeah. You know, so sometimes <coughs> there's some utility in being on edge all the time, especially in a dangerous sure. environment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next dimension is conscientiousness and conscientious people are industrious. Mm-hmm. And so they're guilty if they're not working. Hmm. They have to work. Yeah, I have that's that. Me. You're like that. Me yeah, too. It's you brutal. Too. It's awful. It's brutal. I hate it. Yeah. Because I'm very yeah. self-aware of it. Like, um, I feel like I can never relax. Right. And I feel like yeah. I never got anything done. Right, right. Okay, so, so we figured out why that is. Yeah. Okay, the reason is, is you're conscientious. Mm. So that that's associated often with, well, f- feelings of shame or guilt if you haven't got what you should have got done. Mm-hmm. And then if you're also high in negative emotion, then you worry about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so that's that that can be rough. And so, and the last dimension is openness and openness is basically interest in ideas and creativity, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so if you take this test at understandmyself.com, it will tell you where you are in relationship to 10,000 other people Mm. on those Mm -hmm. dimensions. And it's useful for, we're going to make a couples version of it so that you'll get a, we haven't got it up yet. So you'll have a report saying, well, you know, you're really orderly and you're not. And so you're going to have tension in your relationship because- The orderly person is always going to be annoyed by your disorderliness <laughs> and end up cleaning up after you all the time. <laughs> and so you're going to have to be aware of that because that's going to be, and you know, you're open and your partner isn't. Well, you're going to want to go to plays and movies and read books and discuss ideas. And they're not going to be interested in that at all. And, you know, you kind of think of those as opinions, but they're really deeply rooted. No, it sounds, so, are we doomed to, to just possess these characteristics that we hate about ourselves, even if we're self-aware of it? How do, no, you, how do you address these issues of self-improvement? Okay, well, people get more conscientious and more and less neurotic and more agreeable as they get older. Mm. So you could think about that perhaps as the development of wisdom. I also mm. think that you can, you can learn the opposite traits through practicing micro habits. So, for example, in my clinical practice, I've often had introverted people who need to act in an extroverted way in order, say, to be successful lawyers because they have to go out and drum up business. They have to meet with people. And they can learn the habits of an extroverted person, but they have Mm. to learn them from the bottom up. Mm. It's it's not natural to them. And if you're not very conscientious, for example, like a schedule is learning how to use a a schedule Mm -hmm. and then learning how to stick to it can be really useful, as can making a life plan. I feel like I've so, gone through that with our YouTube channel and, and the podcast because I'm I was usually not in front of the camera and I'm and very uncomfortable with it. And so I've learned how to be more extroverted, I think. Yeah. By like being on video and sheer will of force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I've watched a number of your videos and you're clearly more introverted than mm-hmm. Ethan, you know, and yeah. I, we, I can see the way I can see it in your body language. Cause you kind of pull back and <laughs> you're, you're more hesitant to jump into a conversation. Yeah. And, but, but, but you have a fair bit of positive emotion. You smile a lot. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, so, so that's, that might also make it somewhat easier, but mm-hmm. my, my guess is you're far lower in assertiveness than Ethan. So. See, that's interesting. <laughs> Yula can be pretty, she can be pretty scary. It's that Israeli in her. Yeah. But in public or in private? If it she, depends. Don't push her. Yeah. <laughs> it could be in public. Uh-huh. Yeah. Depends. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting. Would be in, see. I want to take the test. Because my <laughs> yeah. issue is like, I'm aware of my flaws. I'm aware of the things that drive me crazy. But I'm not really sure how to, how to improve it. Right. I don't know. I'm not. Maybe that's the problem is that I don't know how to instruct myself to 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 improve. Well, one of the things. OK, so I have this other program that's the future authoring program I mentioned. OK, so the way it works is that it first of all asks you to think about your life along six or seven dimensions. OK, so here here's the idea. Imagine you were treating yourself like someone you were taking care of, you know, someone you loved and you were taking care of. Hmm. Okay, so you want the best for you, Mm. whatever that is. So it's not like magic wishes. It's nothing like that. It's you're taking care of yourself like a responsible person. Okay, so then it asks you, write a a bit. Three to five years down the road, um, what do you want your friendship network to look like? How do you want your intimate relationship to be going? Or what should it look like? How are you going to stay educated? 
How are you going to handle temptations of drugs and alcohol? Are you going to keep yourself healthy mentally and physically? What are your career goals? And what are you going to do with life outside of work? Mm-hmm. You know? So if, if you could have what would be good for you, just what would that look like? Mm-hmm. Okay. People don't, aren't encouraged to take the time to think that through. And it really matters right. if you think it through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then it says, okay, now you've warmed up. Write for 20 minutes about what your life could look like in three to five years if it was going the way that you wanted it to go. So it'd be good for you. It'd be good for you, good for your family, good for society. Like it'd be good. Mm. You need a vision. Mm. Okay. And then the next step is, okay, now imagine that you let your weaknesses and character flaws get the upper hand and like drive you into the ground. Mm. What does that look like in five years? Mm. Mm-hmm. So that's like a horrific vision, right? And so that's a good thing because now you've got something mm. to run away from. And so if you're anxious, having something bad to run away from is really motivating because you think, well, you know, like maybe I should watch what I eat. It's like, yeah, well, I'd look better. That's, that's not enough motivation. I'm going to be fat and really unhealthy and half dead in five years. It's like, okay, <laughs> that's not so good, right. you know, and so you can run towards the positive thing and run away from the negative mm-hmm. thing. And that, ma- that increases your motivation. Right. And then in the next part, you're asked to make that into a detailed and articulated plan. And so that can help. Like you say, well, you're not sure what habits to change or, or, or what, what, what personality traits to transform. You got to kind of think about that in relationship to what you want. 